Okay, so welcome to another edition of the Prolongevity podcast. And today I'm delighted to welcome uh, someone I've known and followed for a very long time. I've read her, some of her books, I've followed her blogs. Uh, we've met through the Public Health Collaboration, Zoe Harkham. Welcome, Zoe. Thank you very much for having me. No, it's a delight. Um, and to give a little bit of background, because Zoe and I know each other rather well, and in our community she's well known, but outside our small world perhaps not. So Zoe is a researcher, she's an author, she's a blogger, and a fantastic public speaker in the sort of field of diet and health. And her particular areas of interest are public health, especially dietary guidelines, nutrition and fat, and, and the relationship with obesity. And I'm sure we'll, we'll get into that in some detail. She's got a BA and an MA from Cambridge University, so a brain the size of a planet. And uh, not so long ago, actually, in 2016, she was awarded a PhD in public health nutrition. And the thesis title was An Examination of the Randomised Controlled Trial and Epidemiological Evidence for the Introduction of, of Dietary Fat Recommendations in 1977 and 1983, a systemat systematic review and meta-analysis. Just trips off the tongue. <laughs> I'm glad um, you said I that. I think the point, the point about you, Zoe, is I think that all sounds very intellectual and very complex. And where I think you're so remarkable is um, your reviews are unbelievable. Um, I learned so much from you, but your ability to turn all that complexity into something lay people can understand and even the occasional pharmacist is, is quite remarkable. Oh, thank you. That's very kind. <laughs> so thank you once again for joining us. I know you're really busy and I think this is at least your second uh, Zoom of the day uh, podcast. So uh, I thought we might start by just discussing a little about your own background and your ac academic history. OK, I mean, it was actually at Cambridge that all of this started fascinating me and it made no sense that we had obesity at any kind of level and it was starting to take off. Um, so 80s, 90s, um, a, a problem that we'd never previously seen. My mum didn't see it. Our grandparents didn't see it. Um, it started to take off and it, it just didn't make sense. I've never met anyone who wants to be overweight, let alone obese. Um, you can be OK with your size and you can accept the size that you are. But that is different to being OK with it. And if somebody were to give you a magic pill and to say, OK, you're now going to be a size eight or 10 or 12 or whatever you want to be that's in female sizes I don't know anyone who wouldn't take that pill to be quite honest and I know people who hate dieting but they go through this incredible pain on a repeated basis because the perceived reward is just so great so I'm a mathematician by background I did I did the entrance exam into Cambridge on maths I switched to economics when I was there so that was sort of more big problem solving um, and it's just a conundrum to me and I've been fascinated by it ever since. So to understand obesity, you have to understand when it started. And if you look back at the UK, we've got some great data um, before we were devolved. So we had the four nations as part of the UK. Obesity in 1972 for both men and women was 2.7%. And then by the end of the last millennia, it was 25.8% for women. And I think it was 22.6% for men. So, in, so basically, we've seen a tenfold increase yeah. in a generation or two. Yeah. In, in fewer than three decades, yeah. So, which kind of means either something fundamental has happened to our genes in 50 years, which has or we've all become very fat and very lazy in 50 years, or there's, another, or there's something else about it, right? Yeah, and, and that is the thing. When people say, oh, it's genetic. Yes, there's a genetic element to obesity. Um, just as there's a genetic element to virtually every, every other attribute of a human being. So if I had two super tall parents, I would be super tall. Um, you've got that kind of genetics going on. But you're right, in a generation, it cannot explain that explosion in obesity. And when people have looked and said, oh, it must be because we ate too much and we did too little. Actually, no, the data don't hold that up. So if you look at the calorie intake over that period, and I did in a, a book I wrote on obesity back in 2009, um, the calorie intake actually went down during that period. Um, and in many ways, exercise actually went up. I, I remember when I was knocking around on a street corner when I was a kid, if a jogger had, had gone by, we'd have laughed, we'd have stopped what we were doing. It would have been so astonishing. Um, I mean, it's just the norm now. People are out running, they're out cycling, they're going to gyms, they're in health clubs. Um, it's just the norm. We didn't do that. We just walked to school and played hockey. Or if you had a sport you liked, you did your sport. But 
we didn't do all of this obsessive, you know, I've got to do my crunches and I've got to follow, you know, I've got to do Joe Wicks or something because there's a yeah. lockdown. I mean, we didn't get fat and, you know, fat through being lazy and greedy. That This is something that Gary Taubes says so brilliantly. If you're saying that we ate too much and we did too little, you're basically saying we're greedy and lazy. And that's not very nice. And it's also not accurate. And that's what I believe as well. So you... You have to look at what happened. Now, I'm really open to anyone coming up with any other suggestion, but something that did happen is that we changed our dietary guidelines. Yes. And we used to believe that carbohydrates made you fat and fat was full of fat soluble vitamins. And we kind of just turned that on its head and said, fat is now really bad. We think it causes heart disease. You must avoid it. And I guess one of my own big penny drop moments was when. I realized there's only three things that we eat. So if you'd sort of draw, imagine a little pie, uh, excuse the pun, um, we only eat carbohydrate, protein, and fat. And protein, take it from me, I can give you academic references if you want, but both theoretically and empirically, we eat about 15% of our diet in the form of protein. We just do. Um, it might be as high as 20%, but work at about 15%, 15, 20. Um, as soon as you then set a fat upper limit of 30%, you've immediately set a carbohydrate lower limit of 55%. And that's what we did. Back yep. in 1977 in the US, that then got embedded in the US dietary guidelines, which come out every year, sorry, every five years, 1980, 85, 90, and so on. And that has just served to reinforce fat is bad, carbs are good, especially carbs if they've got fiber, lols. Um, and we have ended up on this low fat, high carb diet. And Along the way, we've also got fatter and sicker. And there are many different ways of explaining why that has happened, but just observe it as the opening point, which is something did change. As I've said, give me another explanation and I'll look at it, but that's a massive one. And until someone can disprove that as a hypothesis, I'm interested in it. So this is an obvious kind of area of interest for people in who've got medical degrees or nursing or as I have pharmacy it's not an obvious area for someone with a degree in maths or or or, or uh, economics so what drew you into it I mean yeah no, personally probably my brother becoming type 1 diabetic when he was 13 and I was 15 and I immediately realized the difference between insulin and and glucose and we were trained as a family to observe when he was high in glucose and when he was high in insulin and what we needed to do. Um, so I knew that if my brother were going into a hypo, he was getting very low blood glucose because he'd taken too much insulin. Um, I knew that I had to get something into him really quickly. Um, and I knew that all that took was, um, and he was really, really bad. I can remember a time in my 20s, I lived very near him in London and he was really bad. And you just have to, he, he was on the floor at this point. We'd been watching a movie, him, him and his girlfriend and me. And we just hadn't realized that he'd been going lower and lower and lower during the movie. And we got up to the end of the movie and his girlfriend said, oh, you're going to walk Zoe home now. And he just said, yes, but clearly had no idea what walking me home meant. And um, his girlfriend said, oh, you know, don't you need to put your shoes on? And he kind of looked at his feet, but he, I mean, he was just, he was not with us. Um, and then he sort of fell to the floor and you just need the tiniest amount of orange juice um, and you're sort of trying to pour it in and, and you just need some to touch the lips. And it's like a magic pill. It, it's like mm -hmm. a defibrillator. Um, or you get a Mars bar. He would always have one close to hand. And you just smear a bit of the caramel or chocolate on his lips and he would go. To, and that's it. That's all it, it took. Um, and what that kind of thing makes you realize as well is that. And I get so mad when I see people saying this on Twitter. Oh, how dare you attack sugar? My type one little child, if he doesn't have sugar, he might die. It's like, no, it's not lack of sugar that might cause your little one to die. It will be too much insulin. Yeah. Part four is insulin. If you didn't put too much insulin in, it doesn't matter what carbohydrate then went in next. My brother had a hypo because he put too much insulin in. Now you can say too much insulin relative to what he then ate at dinner, but he still put too much insulin in. You know, and, and people just don't get this. So this, this, it makes you challenge this whole, you must eat carbohydrate. Well, actually you don't need to eat carbohydrate at all. Um, it, it's very interesting because we know that type ones literally wither away yeah. and they wither away because their bodies can produce no insulin yeah. and that means energy can't enter the cell. Yeah. And so however many Mars bars you feed them or however many calories you put inside them, 
yeah. will have absolutely no effect if you don't add insulin. Yeah. We also know that when you add the insulin, that allows energy into the cell. Yeah. And immediately someone starts on insulin, they put weight on, yeah. which tells you there's something to do, some direct relationship between insulin and weight. Yeah. What we also know is that as you add in more insulin, people's metabolic rate drops. Yeah. So we also know that insulin, just from what the fundamental basic observations of type one, insulin lets energy into cells, more insulin um, lowers energy consumption. Yeah. So this idea of um, eat a little less and move a little more, while it might not be without any basis whatsoever, life is much more complicated, isn't it? Oh yeah, um, I mean, where to start on that one? One of the, I mean, you probably saw this at the, the calorie presentation, which is online. If you go to, I think it was um, 2018, public health collaboration conference. Um, and we did one on, yeah, calories, yeah. kettlebells, whatever. Yeah. And I think um, without having the chart in front of me, I, I can probably still do this. So I take a typical female, 2000 calories a day. And people think that calories are equal, which is why they don't seem to mind if you're having 55% of them in the form of carbohydrate and 30% in the form of fat. Forget micronutrients for now. We're just looking at those big macronutrients yeah. like carbohydrate and protein. And they don't seem to realize that they have different jobs to do. And this is mostly driven by something called the basal metabolic rate. So in that typical female, 2000 calories a day, let's say she's just moderately active. She's doing something three times a week. She's not a triathlete or anything. Um, she will need 1500 of her calories in the form of um, things that can supply the basal metabolic rate. Now they will predominantly be fat and protein because the things that are in the basal metabolic, I mean, we think of the basal me metabolic rate as if you're lying in bed all day and you've got flu and you're feeling really unwell and you don't get up, you don't move around, you've still got to do certain things. You've got to build bone density. You've got to fight infection, particularly at that time. Um, you've got to do muscle repair and cell repair and da -da -da -da, all the other things. You've also got to run your brain, which consumes totally, a lot of energy. Totally. Yeah. And a great proportion of that is needed in the form of fat and protein. Now, for your other 500 calories, let's say um, she's not ill in bed, she's up and about, so she's moderately active, 500 calories, that can be supplied by either fat or carbohydrate. Now, as a last resort, if you had somebody on a really stupid diet, and I'm thinking bodybuilders here, and they're not really eating fat, and they're not really eating carbohydrate, they're just, you know, these protein shaped junkies or whatever. As a last resort, the body will use protein for energy, but it really is a last resort. So let's just think fat or carbohydrate for the energy, fat and protein, mainly for the basal metabolic rate. So then when the government says have 55% of your diet in the form of carbohydrate, that's 1100 calories. So the body said, I needed a maximum of, let's keep it simple. There is some carbohydrate that can help with basal metabolic rate. It can help, but let's just keep it really simple and say, okay, the basal metabolic bit is fat and protein. The energy bit is fat and carbohydrate. So you had 600 calories more than you needed to use up for energy, but you didn't have enough. You had 400 calories too few in terms of what you had for your fat and protein. So this is how we end up fat and sick because we're eating too much carbohydrate and not enough fat and protein. And what happens when people go on a diet, so that 2000 calorie a day woman is feeling a bit overweight and wants to lose a bit. What she cuts back on primarily is fat because the calorie theory says fat approximates to nine calories a gram and protein and carbohydrate approximate to four calories a gram. It's not precise science at all. I go through it in that presentation and I make yeah. a few jokes out of it because um, mm -hmm. it is really ridiculous. Um, but that's the bit that they know. So they avoid fat. So they're avoiding the one macronutrient that can actually do everything. It's the one most likely to be used up by the body because it can be used for the basal metabolic stuff and it can be used for energy. It's not going to get left over at the end of the day. The body is going to use it somehow. So the woman cuts back on fat. So you've got even less fat and protein combined to do your repair and maintenance work. And you didn't make any difference in terms of your energy because you're probably still at 700 calories of carbohydrate, which is still more than you needed. Yeah. So people think, how could I ever... You know, people say just eat less forget the do more just eat less you will lose weight no you could cut back 500 calories a day of fat and protein cut back 500 calories a day of carbohydrate and you've still eaten too much for what your body actually wanted to use so people just you've got to think smarter don't just think oh a calorie is a calorie is so not a calorie 
um, think what your body actually needs, what is going to fuel you for the day and, and therefore eat what your body wants. And trust me, your body wants what the planet provides. It does not want cereal and bread and legumes and the things that the government are trying to get us to eat. It wants yeah. animals. If you can catch it, eat the whole damn thing. And it wants things that grows on the, grow on the trees and, and things that grow out of the ground. And that's about it. And that's what we've stopped eating. That's what we've demonized. So that's kind of eat real food encapsulated. Yeah. Which is so what I take, do. Yeah. Take you back a bit because we've talked about calories. Now, the technical definition of a calorie is the amount of energy it requ is required to, to increase the temperature of one mill of water by one degree C. That's the technical definition of a calorie. That's physics. <laughs> that doesn't apply to biology. And I've never known anyone dis dispel the calorie myth better than you have. And this whole thing with the bomb calorimeter and, and so on. So um, how do you fancy having a go at that? Because oh, I just sorry, think it, yeah, how you do it is it. just masterful. Oh, thank you. Um, well, yeah, I hope I'm, I'm going to go after. Are you talking about the um, thermodynamics and the? Yeah. Okay, right. So, yeah. what people say is they say. Um, if you I mean, there is something. I mean, by definition, if you're putting weight on, by definition, you're taking in more calories than you're losing, right? That that must be the case. No, no. I I actually I don't even know if I believe that because really I yeah I could. I could remove your thyroid right now. Yeah. And you would gain weight. Yeah. I could put you through the menopause, lols, couldn't, but you can self identify yeah. as a woman for a few minutes. I can put you through the menopause and you will gain weight. Yeah. And children will go through puberty and they will gain weight. Yeah. And this is where Gary Taubes is coming from. So people never say, oh my goodness, that teenager just grew a foot because he ate too much. Yeah. They say he started eating lots more because he was growing. You know, we have the direction of causation the wrong way around. You eat more when you're growing. You don't, I mean, you do grow because you eat more, but it's, it's this whole sort of iteration kind of thing. You know, do people run up the escalator because they're slim and able to? Or is it the slim, are you slim because you ran up the escalator? I run up the escalator because I'm able to. Um, I don't think it makes me slim at all. I think what I do has absolutely bugger all to do with my size i think my fitness mate and i'm not that you know i walk i walk and i do some weights or whatever i'm really like what do i need to do to be functionally fit and that's it yeah, i'm not an exactly. exercise junkie at all um mm. so what i am doing trust me is not making any difference to my weight it, it makes me functionally fit it makes me feel good it makes me stronger it, it, i've got good muscles on that video if people go and watch it um and that's it what my size is entirely determined by what I put in my mouth and what I put in my mouth, not how much. Um, so let's go back and look at the history of the calorie and the theory behind it. God, so we go back to about the 1900s when you've got um, at water, um, God, who was the other one? Um, at water and somebody wherever. I mean, they were, they were, they, they were trying to, I mean, some of this work actually started in, in America in the early 1900s because they were actually trying to assign value to alcohol. Um, yeah. That was one of the drivers behind this. So, um, you know, when men were working really hard over in America and, and they were trying to, you know, their food shortages and all the rest of it, they were trying to think, oh, well, we've got lots of stout or whatever they were drinking at the time. Can this help in some way? So they were sticking things. They developed this thing called a bomb calorimeter, which just means you put... Um, a substance in this device and it will tell you you burn it and it will tell you how many calories it's given off and as you said with the definition earlier on that calorie is something that could heat something by a, a degree um, of water so but this that's... is this is this is the big point i think which is human beings are not a bomb calorimeter no absolutely because absolutely. the bomb calorimeter is based on as you say you get whatever the substances are you burn it in a bomb calorimeter oxidize it and you measure the amount of heat that it generates yeah right yeah and that's not applicable to human beings and all of this you know uh theoret this idea of uh, of the of the assignation of the, of the calorific value of proteins fats and so on is also pretty specious so <clears throat> talk to us a little bit about all of that yeah so i mean one of the big problems that we've got here is when we're looking at the bomb calorimeter we're looking at energy yeah. And when we're talking about the laws of physics, so I actually challenged a dietitian in a conference. This was back in 2009. I'd been an HR director 
um, a blue chip organizations working all over the world and thought, right, enough, enough of that. I want to do a second career. Nutrition has always been my passion. I want to move into that. So I went along to one of my first conferences and she'd said something about the laws of thermodynamics in her talk or something. She said, oh, um, it's all about energy in and energy out. And if you put too much energy in or you don't put enough energy out, you're going to get fat. That's basically what she said. And I was thinking, um, you've made a huge leap there from energy to weight. And the laws of thermodynamics don't say anything about weight. So I kind of asked her a question on it. And she clearly wasn't prepared to have the question because it was kind of, you know, almost like, what on earth are you asking me anything? You know, this is this is the Bible. This is how it is. Yeah. And I remember going away afterwards and thinking about it and just this isn't how it is. So energy is one thing. Now, they say, oh, um, there's a law of, of the, the physics, law of thermodynamics, they're interchangeable terms, that says energy in equals energy out. Well, there isn't. The first law of thermodynamics says energy shall be conserved. So first of all, it says in a closed system, which is a massive caveat, because that's what you just alluded to. We are not closed systems. In a closed system, energy in and energy used up in that closed system and energy out will balance. But it doesn't mean energy in equals energy out. Um, so I would use the example you put um, energy, let's say you put coal into a power station. So you put a certain amount of coal energy into a power station and you get a certain amount of electricity energy out. Now, the coal that went in weighed tons. The electricity that comes out weighs nothing. And, and yet energy will have been conserved. There's also a second law of thermodynamics, which is really important, which is the law of entropy. It's also called the law of common sense. And it's also the law that kind of explains um, energy kind of always isn't conserved because we're not closed systems. So you boil the kettle, energy has gone in in the form of electricity, and then you heat up the water. But you've also got a ton of stuff coming out of the spout. Yeah. And that's energy loss. And we lose energy all the time. We sweat, we get warm. Um, we've got products coming in, we've got products coming out the other end. So we are just not closed systems. Now, when I used to um, be a bit more of a, a sugar addict in my 20s, um, my boyfriend at the time used to think it was hilarious. If I if I had a real sort of go at a box of chocolates and I could usually demolish a whole damn thing, um, I turned into a little furnace. So he, he used to literally just go like that and then warm his mm. hands on my face. I, yeah. I, turned, I was just losing heat energy. My body had just decided, you've just put a shed load of carbohydrate in that I've got no use for whatsoever. It was even junk carbohydrate. Turn it up. Yeah, just just I'm going into burn overdrive. It wasn't very pleasant for me. It was like having a hot flush in your twenties. Yeah. Um. So the body just just uses it up. So, you know, energy does not equal weight. So we invented this formula, where we said one pound of fat contains three and a half thousand calories. And I break that down in that presentation, and show that actually we can't even prove that bit. And just by being out, how much we're out could make a difference of us gaining eight stone in a year or losing one stone in a year i mean it is worse than useless yeah. but nevertheless we made this formula and you'll still see it on the internet you'll see it in men's health you'll see it in magazines where they say oh if you cut back by three and a half thousand calories which is just 500 calories a day for the week by the end of the week you will have lost one pound oh yep. no you won't you just won't um or better still cut back by a thousand calories a day and you'll have lost two pounds Oh, no, you won't. And I stand there and say, look, I'm 110 pounds. If I did that over the course of a year, I should weigh six pounds in a year's time. And everyone laughs and I say, why are you laughing? Yep. That's the formula that you believe if you're going for every 7,000 calorie deficit that you yep. create and you won't. You just won't. I've just shown you how you can create a calorie deficit. And all you do is make your body sicker and you you still have too many calories that the body doesn't want to use. And there's another issue, actually, that um, this whole sort of getting fat and sick at the same time by not eating the fat and protein that we should be eating and by eating too much of the carbohydrate. That's where you get this this dual thing that we have observed over the last four decades. I mean, you'll have observed this as a pharmacist. We we look and we look crap. I'm sorry, there's no other word, you know, go, go on a a tube train or something and look around at your average human being we do not look well as a species well, at the moment that's kind of what made me become the pharmacist that gave up drugs <laughs> because i built up this group of 10 pharmacies we were na multiple national award winners um I, I played a very very senior role in in my profession uh, completely restructured the profession and i just reached a point where i thought 
you know, half the country's taking statins, yeah. half the country's taking antidepressants. I'm spooning tablets into everyone. Mm -hmm. We're medicating an entire society now, and I've seen that just in my 35 years of practice. No one's getting any better. Yeah. That wasn't what I set out to do. Yeah. And I just thought, you know, this ultimately isn't satisfying. And that made me rethink everything, because everything you've said, which I now believe to be wrong, was everything I believed for 25 years, because it's how I was taught. I understand physics. You know, pharmacy is very, very scientific and I can calculate all these ratios. And I knew about the generation of ATP and all of that. What is bizarre is that we all learn this fundamental science. I mean, pharmacy is particularly scientific. And yet we end up in this backwater, actually, where there's no basis. Mm -hmm. And one of my favorite things that you've done is you actually wrote to all the lead organizations and asked them to explain the evidence that supported this thing about three and a half thousand calories and fat. Oh yeah, God, I remember that. That was back in 2009. Um, and it was after this conference where this dietitian was, you know, practically scoffing at me yep. um, in disdain that I could ask such a stupid question, um, which I thought was hilarious. So I thought I'd write to the British Dietetic Association, the Association for the Study of Obesity, Department of Health, National Institute of Care and Health Excellence, nice, um, NHS, oh God, I can't remember. Oh, they have a, a dietitians in obesity management, which is a subset of the dietitians and a, another organization. There were seven of them and I wrote off to mm. them. And um, five of them basically came back and said, we're really sorry, we don't know. Even though I would point out, look, it's actually in your document here, verbatim. You really need to know. You know, I didn't accept that as a first answer, but then they just come back and say, no, no, we're really sorry, you don't know. Um, and then we suggest you contact dietitians in obesity management or the Association for the Study of Obesity. It's like, yes, I have. They bounced you around the system for I know they did. And then the, the hilarious thing was that those two organizations, the Association for the Study of Obesity and Dietitians in Obesity Management, both came up with the same number. And I am having to reach this off the top of my head now. Um, they came back with a document. Um, that had a study and I think it was of about I don't know 12 people or something or 20 people I mean it was absolutely tiny and they said oh look they've been given a 650 calorie deficit over a year and I think the average mean weight loss was something like 17 pounds yeah so you do the maths and it was something like they should all have lost 70 pounds and that's actually 70 pounds in fat alone because the yep. calorie theory is about fat. So there's yep. more on top in terms of water and lean tissue. So she probably have been up at about, you know, my hundred pound weight loss that I use as a joke. Um, and everyone should have been the same. A formula is a formula. It doesn't matter yep. if, um, you know, a 50 stone um, boy is deciding to lose weight or a six stone granny is deciding to lose weight the formula shall apply equally yeah. they both cut back by 500 calories a day they should both lose two pounds over the week we know of course that's absurd yeah um so and i think the range of weight loss no i think the average was actually about 11 pounds and the range was something like less than a pound to 17 pounds or something so it's here just... we have so we've written to every single lead or you wrote to every lead organization yeah all of whom are quoting this calories in calories out yeah that um as a fact it's kind of I, I remember talking to dan grief about this on the uk low carb podcast and we're all taught this as if it's gravity right mm -hmm. and it's it's become such a gravitational thing you don't no one questions gravity <laughs> and in the way that health professionals are trained trained it will be like if you challenge this stuff you must be a flat earther yeah, yeah. and the only person in the room who's had the courage to stand up and say OK, let me be that flat earther. Let me ask this fundamental question of all these lead organisations is one Zoe Harkham. And none of them had an answer except one of them had a go. And they come back to you with one single study. And when you dig into the one single study, even that study not only doesn't prove what they're saying, it actively disproves what they're saying. And even though the average weight loss was, I think, as you said, 11 pounds, the variation in weight loss was from no weight loss to quite a few pounds of weight loss yeah. among 12 say. people. Yeah. So whereas all 12 people should have lost 76 pounds. The so there is simply no 
intellectual, scientific, clinical. There's no justification in any of this. And it, we've literally, and, and I'm guilty, right? My my professional house is built on, on, on sand, just like everybody else's for 25 years. And this is why I'm so grateful for pe to people like you for, for being prepared to ask, to, you know, see the elephant in the room or whatever metaphor we want to ask these questions and disprove these myths. And then when you do that, I mean, I've never been afraid of doing that. I remember when I when I first went up to Cambridge to do maths and it's really levelling because I went to a comprehensive school. I mean, my school was rough. It was really rough. Um, I had the chance to go to a private school. I just didn't want to. I had some great friends at my comprehensive school. Um, so ending up at Cambridge from the school that I went to, it, it just sort of didn't kind of happen kind of thing. So you get up to Cambridge and you think you're quite good at maths because you were really good at maths at your comprehensive. Yeah. And then it's like, whoa, OK, um, I'm now amongst the Japanese and the Chinese. And, and I've had a real, you know, I've, it's brought me down to earth. Um, yeah. I like to think I was never I've never had much of an ego, but it, it was really leveling. And I would still be in a lecture. I can remember one lecture when this guy was just up at the front and he was writing just reams of letters and equals and brackets and equations. I'm kind of looking around and I'm thinking, nobody is understanding this. Everyone is looking as baffled as I am, but nobody's going to say anything. So he gets to the end and he says, any questions? And I said, I put my hand up and I said, um, yes, I've got a question. I said, uh, what, what have you just done? I've got absolutely no idea. And everybody laughed and he laughed and he said, oh, bless, bless you, you're so sweet. And then just carried on. And yet yeah. everyone around me is going, no, he, uh, that's a good question. I wanted to ask that. It's like, yeah, but you didn't, did you? Um, but none of us understood it. And the chances mm -hmm. are, if you think, hang on a sec, this doesn't, like this at the moment, I mean, we shouldn't talk about COVID, but if there's any part of it that just doesn't feel right to you, that two years ago would have felt inconceivable, Go with your instinct because there's some stuff happening at the moment that is just not right. You just don't lock your granny in a hospital and let her die alone. You do not lock your elderly ones away from family for months on end. You know, don't start me with yeah. Go with I, your I, hunch. I, I don't want to get into the COVID debate because yeah. I, I kind of we'll get sidetracked. But yeah, I know I'm think fine the, with that. But, but, but I, I think the say... point you're making is, uh, um, you probably know my, my, my partner's a GP and um, she's a pretty low carb GP, like I'm a low carb pharmacist. And she, she's she been a, a trainer. She's trained endless numbers of doctors and she has a lot of trainees through her hands. And her consistent, she says that when she was training, they were kind of trained to challenge and they weren't frightened to try things. And she says to these uh, young, bright young people, I mean, they are super seriously bright, these trainee medics. Why don't you question any of this stuff? Mm. And I just kind of feel that all these systems of training health professionals have become so hierarchical that it needs someone like you or someone from an engineering background like Ivor mm -hmm. to come in and challenge all these norms and name the elephant in the room because we've kind of, it's been trained out of us, whereas it should be trained into us. And, and I think that's find... part of the problem. We don't question yeah. this hierarchy. Yeah, and when, when you find one thing that's wrong, trust me, you question everything. So you mm. find... The calorie theory is nuts. So you go, oh, five a day. Where does that come from? And again, you go and ask the questions. You then do your own research and they can't give you the right answer. So then you go to the eat badly plate and you ask the questions. You find out who, who dis, who's responsible for it. And at the time I asked the questions, it was the Food Standards Agency. So dear Food Standards Agency, where do you get these proportions from? And it's just so interesting because they do reply and they say, oh, it's by, I mean, first of all, it's interesting to know, is it by weight or is it by calories? So when we've got that pictorial representation, when you're saying that a third of your plate should be vegetables and fruits, for example, is that by weight or by calories? So you find out it's by weight. And it's just like, okay, so that's interesting. Um, that's not how we measure food stuff. When we're mm. saying 55% of your diet in the form of carbohydrate, we mean 55% of your calories not 55% of your grams. Nobody weighs their food or you shouldn't weigh your food. Yeah. Um, so you then do the calculation to say, okay, so if the average per hundred grams of fruit is let's say 40 calories. And if your average of vegetables, is, let's say, you know, I worked it all out and I did loads of different fruits and vegetables, get it really accurate. 
And you realize then that your proportion of your daily intake from fruit and vegetables is going to end up at about 6%. And then conversely, the starchy bit, which is supposed to be 33% of the weight, ends up as over 50%. It's like, whoa. And then you start looking at the conflicts. It's like, okay, so we've got Kellogg's, we've got General Mills, we've got cereal companies, we've got bread companies, we've got Warburton's. No wonder. They I want to come back to that because I think okay. this is really important. So I'm really pleased that you brought that up because that's another thing I learned from you from that presentation, the, the which is in most areas of life where you have a conflict of interests, you declare it very publicly. And then you either recuse yourself or you allow others to judge should you recuse yourself. What you do not do is carry on taking money from with a direct conflict and not acknowledge it. Yeah. And one of the things I learned from your presentation was who writes the what you call the eat badly plate. And I, I think that's a great way of putting it. It's so-called the eat well guide. Tell us a little bit about more of that, because there's this gravitational pull thing, this hierarchical pull thing that is part of the problem. Mm -hmm. But I also have reached the conclusion that a lot of the system, and I'm not, I've worked in the NHS all my life. I'm passionate supporter of the NHS. So I don't want to sort of come across as anti the NHS. Um, and I also think there's a lot of good stuff come out of Public Health England, just not the dietary stuff. But tell us who is actually writing this guidance and explain how conflicted they are. OK, so it started off as the balance of good health plate. And that was back in about 94. Um, and it, it looked much more cartoon like then. Um, and I'm not sure people pay too much attention to it. At the time I started looking at it, the Food Standards Agency was in charge and it was called the Eat Well Plate. Yeah. And it had a can of Coca-Cola on it. Yep. And, 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 and other bits of junk. I mean, it was pretty much unforgivable. Um, and it wasn't entirely clear at that stage who had put it together. It was just kind of, as, as you say, one of those things that becomes part of the fabric. So then I became very interested in it. And I was writing to the Food Standards Agency saying, where do these proportions come from? And then at Public Health England, it was Alison Tedstone. Um, and I do think there was a, a Radio 4 programme um, Adrian, and I can't remember his surname, it wasn't Charles, it was Adrian, one of the, the, the Radio 4 presenters, and he did a half hour program on could our dietary fat guidelines be wrong, and it was soon after one of the first papers came out from my PhD, because that really, it just made global headlines of, oh my goodness, you know, we might have been telling people not to eat fat all of these years, and there was actually never any evidence base, mm. um, so we did this program, Asim was on the program, um, I can't remember, Nina Teicholz was on the programme, I think, you know, he'd really contacted some good people. Yeah. And Alison was on the programme. And so he challenged her and said, why is there a can of Coca-Cola on the Eat Well guy, Eat Well plate? And she said, no, there isn't. He said, yes, there is. And you could almost hear this thing in the room as if she was thinking, when I get back to my desk, there Someone, are going to be someone's some gonna die. heads rolling. <laughs> yeah. And really soon after that, the whole Eat Well plate was looked at. And it didn't change that much, but the can of Coca-Cola disappeared. I mean, it disappeared kind of off to the bottom left-hand corner. It was hilarious. They just couldn't. It rolled off the page slowly, exactly. didn't it? Exactly. They, yeah. they couldn't totally get rid of it. But at around 2016, so I think it was March 2016, that the Eat Well plate became the Eat Well guide. And this is where I'm sorry, you don't, you, you can be nice about the, I mean, the NHS, yeah, great. Let's all, you know, that's, that's a different being. Public Health England we're talking about here now, and, and this is indefensible. So Alison Tedstone, Public Health England, wanted a panel to review the plate and to turn it into this new thing. And she put together a panel of, quite frankly, the who's who of the fake food industry. And I got a blog up there and it ended up as a, an article in the British Journal of Sports Medicine because they were really interested in all of this. So it was a proper researched academic um, paper that said you had about, again, from memory, 11 panel members. Um, a couple of them never turned up. So it was dominated by... Um, the fake food industry reps and you had a rep from the Institute of Grocery Distribution, the Food and Drink Federation, the British Nutrition Foundation, don't be fooled by the name, that's the who's who of the fake food industry, yeah. British Dietetic Association, I think we're on there. I mean, the conflicts were just, um, I think you had the, oh yeah, that you had the Association of Convenience Stores. Yeah. And 
great you know their job is to look after all the little convenience stores in the country and and do the best by them at that time they were fighting anti-smoking legislation that was coming out from public health england because it's not in the interests of the convenience stores to, to have it more difficult to buy cigarettes because you're going to buy cigarettes and you might buy something else at the same time. And, you know, that's yep. how little they cared about public health. And then out yep. they come with this same old, same old, which is fat is bad, carbs are good, eat loads of cereals. Um, and they put some menus up at the time, Public Health England, at the time they did this relaunch, they put some menus up, they took them down really quickly. I grabbed them before they took them down. And then I got to work with a friend and independently, Um, We worked on the menus and we put them through the US Department of Agriculture, all foods database, and we chose a representative food and we ran it through and we were consistently showing that they were trying to get us to have about 70%, 65 to 70% of our diet in the form of carbohydrate. Fat was down at 15%, protein is that typical sort of 15%. You're only Um, left with carbs, basically. You're left with carbs. And then, of course, um, the, the friend that I asked to do this um we also because the micronutrients and fatty acids essential fatty acids are all in that usda database so we both independently drove it off and then came together and and compared and okay we might have chosen a slightly different food okay you went for a broccoli for a green vegetable i went for a spinach yeah whatever um we were just coming out with a diet that was catastrophically deficient in fat soluble nutrients vitamins a d e and k um you didn't get enough iron you didn't get it in the right form you didn't get enough zinc you didn't get it in the right form you didn't get enough omega-3 fatty acids um you need epa and dha ala is not the same um your protein was probably suspect because they think protein from legumes is the same as protein from red meat and fish and eggs and it isn't um yeah the the the, the lack of awareness of nutrition was astonishing yeah. and and, and so unhealthy, you're going out to the UK population saying that's what you should be eating, guys, and you're making us fat and sick. And then we get to a, a virus like COVID when if there's ever a time in your life you want a good vitamin D level, now is the time Absolutely. you want it. Good immune system. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and good levels of zinc and good levels of vitamin C. And we haven't had that from Public Health England for many, many years. So I'm sorry. I am pissed off with them, if I'm allowed to say that on a nice internet yeah, yeah. podcast. So it, right. Which kind of segues nicely um, into my next question, really. Um, and, and you've covered it, uh, really. So my next question is going to be, we know we're all getting fatter and sicker. What's the root cause and what are the solutions? So you've kind of covered the root causes, but you might want to add something. But now I think let's move on to solutions. Yeah, I mean, in an essence, we're eating the wrong things and we're eating too much of the wrong things. And the other thing about eating too much carbohydrate, because our body is not using it, um, there are also certain attributes of carbohydrates in that, um, you know, we need one teaspoon of glucose in our bloodstream at any one time, one teaspoon, they're so tiny. So you even eat an apple, you've probably just chucked in about 12 grams of glucose, you know, the fructose has gone off to the liver. I wear a blood. I, I wear a continual blood glucose monitor, right? Quite a lot of the time. The largest sugar spike I've had in the last two weeks: one small green apple. And and as as you know, our dear friend, both of us, David Unwin. Yeah. You know, if you mention the word banana in front no, of David, I, I don't Unwin. go near bananas anymore. Yeah. <laughs> You'll just about have a heart. It's astonishing. I have also done that. I did that for two weeks. Yeah. I got hold of one of those um, absolutely fascinating exercises. Every single person on the planet in the Western world who can afford um, and has access to bad foods um, needs to wear a continuous glucose monitor for two weeks and try out all the different foods during those two weeks yeah. and you will never see food in the same way again. So as you say, you know, I'd have a, a, a breakfast. Um, I'm, I'm much more real food than I am low carb. So my breakfast, you know, might well be fruit and um, full fat yogurt and full fat milk. I love dairy, just love dairy. Um, but I did one day not have an orange with my breakfast um, and my blood glucose level stayed pretty fine. You know, a couple of berries and some fatty yogurt and fatty milk, lovely, very nice. Had an orange one day, woo, massive yep. spike. Now mine is is coming down because my metabolic system is still healthy and still working okay. But yep. why did I do that to my body? And the dietitians would then have me an apple mid morning as a snack because I've got to have a snack, why? 
And then I'd have a sandwich at lunchtime and probably a bag of low fat crisps because I deserve it and maybe a fizzy drink. And so it goes on. And so it goes on. And I'm just doing that all day long. Yeah. Um, and that's just not good. So that, and when you get that, I mean, the body never quite gets it right back onto that four grams perfectly. It does a good job, but it's not great. So let's say it dips just a fractionally below and everybody who's ever tried to diet will understand this. You, you have some chocolate or you have some, a biscuit or something about 30 minutes later, you want another one. Why, mm. why would that be? You've had a biscuit, you've had a hundred calories. You should have, that should have been satiating. It's the opposite of satiating. So your blood glucose level probably ends up slightly lower than it was before you ate the biscuit. It so goes up the biscuit. Like, uh, and comes down like a lead balloon. Exactly. You then have a hypo and you're starving exactly. and, you and hang the biscuit. And yeah. then you have another biscuit and it all goes off again. So I, 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 yeah. I work a lot with people who are trying to lose weight. So we've got a, an online club where we're trying to get people to just eat real food and support each other um, without being obsessive and all the rest of it, being really positive and encouraging. Yeah, you've done really well. Um, that's what we try to do to keep people on track. And they all get that if you start on the pack of biscuits, you can't stop. Yeah. So don't start on the, on the pack of biscuits. That's the easiest thing in the world. Just don't start on it. And then and then there's no issue. Um, so there's something else about carbs that are they're uniquely addictive, I mean, particularly the refined carbs, the yeah. junk carbs, um, but banana will crash your blood glucose just the same. And yet and when so, you yeah. move more away from carbohydrate to the other two macronutrients, fat and protein, um, you will find those just so much more satiating. Um, and then we'll play with people and say, well, look, why try just for a, a, a thing, when you're going to work in the morning, getting a full fat latte, instead of a skinny latte and notice the difference and the feedback comes back of oh you know i'm normally hungry for lunch at about 12 o'clock i wasn't hungry until one o'clock or two o'clock yeah because they start to realize what's going on so what do you do to lose weight and be healthy i've, I've got three pieces of advice basically number one rule is eat real food um, and you get some idiots on the other side going yeah what's real food um you know i can teach a five-year-old you know, orange is <laughs> Oranges grow on trees, cartons of orange juice don't. Fish swim in the sea, fish fingers don't. Um, you know, cows graze in the field, pepper army sticks don't. You know, how difficult was that? Okay, so eat real food. Number I've got two. this uh, slide that I show and it's got three things on it. It's got butter, margarine, and some complete fake fat. <laughs> and it's got a, a colony of ants. And all the all the ants around the butter. And I say it's weird, isn't it? The ants know what to eat. It's the human beings that don't. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and we've it's because we've not been told the right thing. You know, people trust a dietitian or they'll trust a doctor. And, and the good doctors admit I was at medical school for seven years and I had half a day of nutrition. Yeah, Half the day is good. Most of them get literally nothing. Yeah. And, and that's yeah. when you really admire someone, when somebody like Asim Mel Hotra or David Unwin or Jen Unwin or Joe Reynolds, you know, when those people come out and say, I just yeah. wasn't taught this stuff, but I'm now, I'm here. I've caught up. I'm ready to learn. You know, it's really admirable. Um, so number one, eat real food. Number two, choose that real food for the nutrients it provides. Yeah. Because that then drives you towards meat, especially red, fish, especially oily, eggs, especially yolks, dairy, especially full fat, vegetables, especially non-starchy, berries, stuff in season. I'll eat apple. I mean, I, I, I eat apples all year round. If, if you know, there's one there, I'll eat it. Um, but we should only really eat them in the autumn because that's when they're indigenous to the, to the UK environment. Um, I eat dark chocolate every day. I like it. Um, cocoa powder whatever i had brown rice last night because we had a, a dish that went really nicely with brown rice so i'm you know i'm not religious about it but mm. most of my decisions are i'm choosing if i have brown rice i know there's always something more nutritious that i could have eaten that that's the awareness that i have mm -hmm. um and it's having that awareness because then it it makes you make an, a different choice next time yeah. um you know that's the first time i've had rice in i don't know months i just felt like it so whatever and then the third rule is eat a maximum of three times a day. So if you don't like breakfast, don't have it. If you don't like yeah. lunch or it's just not convenient for you, then make sure you have a great breakfast and, and a good evening meal. Don't ever get to the point that you're um, you're in such a bad place that your, your blood glucose will get so low and you don't have a means of getting it back up to normal 
Um, and, and that happens, by the way, when you're too used to eating carbohydrates. That's Absolutely. We describe the person that can't do that as the person who's not fat adapted. Yeah, um, yeah during that, um, the preceding two weeks, I had the second two weeks I was playing around. The first two weeks, I did a five day fast wearing the CGM. And I just wanted to see how my and I was exercising and doing everything normally. And, um, and my blood glucose, I never had a hypo. My blood glucose was just flat throughout. I mean, it was literally as boring. It was a flat line. Yeah. And didn't change overnight. And I thought when I, because I do park run on a Saturday, I thought I might see a sugar spike. Very slight, whatever. Um, just shows you. Once you're fat adapted, yeah. um, you, and, you know, we've all got a bit of spare fat around us. You can just live on that for a few days. I was hungry about, I had one bad day. I think day two was tough. And by day three, I felt fine at the end of, I was going to do three days, ended up doing five, and I could have carried on. Um, the only reason I stopped was we had a social engagement. <laughs> no one died. <laughs> There's a couple of really interesting things there. I once yeah. worked out that Paula Radcliffe is carrying about 35 calories of, of fat. Um, and everyone would, and this is when she was marathon running, and people yeah. would say, you know, no way, how can, you know, so it's to keep the maths really simple, take a hundred pound woman, she probably yeah. wasn't much off that. Yeah. Even when a woman's got a six pack, she's yeah. got about 14, 12 to 14 um, percent body fat. So that's about 12 to 14 pounds. You can use that calorie theory as a rough guide. It's yeah. nowhere more than that. And it still means that if you cut back by that, you will not lose the weight. Don't get confused, but yeah. you can use it as a sort of guide to what kind of fuel you're calorie carrying. Um, and that's Paula Radcliffe. So if she, she's got that amount of fat such that she could run a marathon, then all she needs to be able to do is to be fat adapted so that she doesn't require the carbohydrate fuel. Um, you don't then bonk, as they call it, during a marathon. You don't have that burn or crash or whatever yep. those different words are because your right. body just seamlessly flicks from carbs to fat or a lot of people won't put any carbs in. Yep. My, um, my brother-in-law runs... Um, I mean, he ran, he had the record for running the coastline of Wales a couple of years ago. He ran 1700 kilometers in 26 days on fat, fat and protein. Yeah, um, and the second interesting point from what you just said there is when your blood glucose level is flatlining, what everyone forgets is that there are two hormones that are keeping your blood glucose regulated. One is insulin, which is called upon. So the minute you eat the apple, the body goes, whoa, glucose too high, panic, panic insulin gets woken up to, to attach itself effectively to the glucose in the bloodstream to take it out yeah. and store it as glycogen. And then conversely, if glucose gets a bit low, as it does with most of us at about four o'clock in the morning, the body will call on the equal and opposite hormone glucagon to put some glucose back into the bloodstream. And it does that by breaking down, well, it will either go to the glycogen storage room yeah. and say, well, if we've got any fuel in there, no. Okay. So I'm going to break down a bit of body fat and just take the glycerol out of the body fat and put that back into the bloodstream. Well, that's weight loss. That's when you're most likely to lose weight. I think this is weight. a really important point that you make here, because there's the widely held misunderstanding that you, because you, the body needs some glucose, that therefore you have to have carbs. And the point is the body will make the amount of carbs it needs by breaking down the fat <coughs> and fat is stored people that everyone hears the word triglyceride but they don't actually understand what it means yeah. and essentially i i kind of visualize it as a letter e mm -hmm. and the prongs of the e are the fat and the backbone is glycerol yeah and when you break down the fat the glycerol goes back to the liver it's remanufactured to glucose yeah. there's the amount of glucose you need yeah. and that is why my you know even if you don't eat any carbs at all your blood glucose will not be zero because the body makes the amount it needs from fat. And it does for everyone. And this, this is the yeah. astonishing thing. You know, I remember being with Prof Noakes down in South Africa once, and I absolutely remember exactly where we were when he said this. We were driving back from a, a function. There's actually a Bantin restaurant. We were in the car, and I can remember the roundabout. And he leaned over the passenger seat, and he said, um, of course, the person who works, off, uh, who works out how to turn off glucagon is the one who's going to win the Nobel Prize. Yeah. And Andy and I were sat in the back of the car and it's like, oh my goodness, that is the secret. If you're trying to maintain blood glucose levels, absolutely, being able to control glucagon. Now, there's probably a reason that we can't because that is the body's way of keeping you alive. So my type one diabetic brother, I had to point out to him, your glucagon still works exactly like yep. mine does. Your insulin. You've got ways to bring the glucose exactly. up, but no way to bring it down. Exactly.
exactly exactly so his fear that he was going to go into a hypo in the middle of the night if he didn't sometimes he'd be setting his alarm to have a biscuit at 4 a.m yeah. in the morning yeah like adrian your body is going to do what it needs to do just don't put too much insulin in otherwise you'll disable it from doing what it's doing because they're antagonists Exactly. So I always think of them as alley cats. You know, if insulin alley cat is out, then glucagon alley cat is not going to be out. Um, yeah, and, and one or the other will be out. So to enable glucagon to break down body fat, you cannot have insulin present. So, I mean, that's the other thing. What is weight loss? Is it a calorie deficit? Oh, where do you start? No. Physiologically, to break down body fat, which is what weight loss is, yep. you have to not have insulin present, which means you haven't just eaten a carbohydrate. And you yep. have to not have carbohydrate present which yep. also means you haven't just eaten carbohydrate, but it also means you haven't eaten sufficient carbohydrate that it's in your glycogen storage room because yep. the body will keep that for about 24 hours. So you only needed 500 calories. Let's say you ate 1100 calories, body packs a shed load over to the glycogen storage room. And then in the middle of the night, when it's running low in glucose, that's where it will go first which is why the calorie counters eating lots of carbohydrate don't lose weight because they, how can you ever lose weight if you've always got- You're always refilling your glycogen stores and you're never getting into burning your fat stores and then you lose that fat adaptation. So when your glycogen store becomes empty, you have a massive hypo, you feel dreadful and you can't access the fat. And And it's partly because you've got a ton of insulin sitting on it and partly because you start to lose the adaptation to, to actually be able to metabolize fat. Yeah. And you have to get people to go through that transition to get them able to burn fat. And then hunger disappears and everything works as it, as two million years of evolution designed it to do. And that's why you, when you said earlier on, and I forget how you exactly phrased it, because you can phrase it in different ways and it can be true. That's why you can eat less than you need and still not lose weight. And I think yeah. that's also why you can eat more than you need and still, still not, not put gain on weight. weight. Um, now, let's say, I mean, this goes back to the Kequin and Paul Wan study now from 1956 in the Middlesex Hospital. They noticed when they gave their obese patients a diet in, in pretty much, they, they did that macronutrient experiment mm. when they gave it pretty much entirely in the form of fat. They were able to give these bedridden patients 2,600 calories a day and they were not gaining weight. They yep. were actually losing weight in some cases. Mm. And then they flicked that over to predominantly carbohydrate and they were gaining weight at a much lower calorie intake. Um, And that is so important for people to understand. The other thing we have to have to the point we have to make on the calorie theory is that this whole energy in energy out thing completely negates the idea that the body can adjust in any way. Exactly. Which which is the craziest madness at all. So if I don't eat enough over the next week, okay, I might be able to shock my body short term to lose a pound or so really quickly it's going to adapt and say right we're turning off the heating system i'm going to make her cold um you can turn off periods it happens in young girls really really quickly when they start stupid diets the lymphatic drainage is going to slow down i'm going to give her a nice puffy um carby looking kind of face kind of thing and it can just go i won't build bone density i won't fight infection i won't do this it just and you'll, just and you'll move a lot less as well because that's exactly. another way Exactly. Yeah, your lower body temperature. Yeah. So the, the point is, as you said at the beginning, we're not a closed system. Yeah. And the body's got numerous ways of conserving energy. Of course it has, because the body's adapted to feast and famine. So if you face the body with something that the body believed to be famine, even if it's not, you'll induce all those mechanisms. Yeah. Yeah. So Zoe, uh, there's loads more I, uh, on my list of questions, um, but I'm conscious of time and oh, particularly well, your oh my time. Goodness, um, and what I'd love to do at some point is have you back on and maybe go into some of the more because there's lots of um, little blind alleys I didn't go, uh, didn't get tempted to go down. But um, and particularly talk about heart disease and so on. But I think that's for another day. Um, now you've written several books, a um, couple of which I've read. You're a prolific blogger. Um, and I've, as I said, I've been binging on your podcast for the last few days. For those of my audience who are not familiar with you, where should they start? Um, yeah, just my name, really. So zoeharkham.com. Um, as you say, I do, I, I've been doing this thing, which has become known as the Monday Note. I've been doing it for over 10 years now. So we had the 500th 
Monday note. Um, and, and that's my business model, basically. So if people can subscribe to that, I think it's a pound a week or something or less if you do it for the whole year. Um, and kind of it's billed as I'll read the studies so that you don't have to. Um, so if something comes out on, um, you know, red meat is going to cause cancer, carbohydrates are going to save your life. Um, I get emails from subscribers and they'll say, well, can you tackle this one? Um, and, and the topics end up incredibly diverse and, and they need to because if I'm, I'm working on a Monday note pretty much constantly the whole time, you, you know, you finish one and you start the next. Um, yeah, we did one recently. I, I, I plagiarised it somewhere on my letter <laughs> yeah. about Inclisaran to the yeah. pharmaceutical journal, which we've blogged about. No, definitely. Yeah. Uh, can but I, mean, you can know, I not... say, though, your research, I mean, no, they're not many people that I kind of implicitly trust because I think that's too big a risk. But the quality and depth of your research is so good, I kind of don't need to check. Oh, thank you. I'm, <laughs> I've, I've got a couple of people like that myself as well, actually. Um, I mean, you, this is the next guy you should have on your podcast, um, Dr. Malcolm not, Kendrick. Oh, Malcolm, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah th th this is his latest book that's come out. And yeah. Mal Malcolm is one of those for me, actually. Um, no, that's really, really kind thing to say. I mean, just, just go to zoeharkham.com. Uh, there are still quite a few on open view um so you know i do I, I do try to put what them on open view um the podcasts uh, my podcasts are on open um listen on spotify and all that kind of thing um l loads of videos i mean all the public health collaboration videos are on open view if you put in youtube my name um the low carb denver ones and that kind of thing there's conference in israel i mean just loads yeah. are, are out there so you don't you don't have to pay anything and um, pick a topic that you're interested in, maybe fiber or maybe dietary fat guidelines and how did we get them and there'll be a, a video out there. Fantastic. Zoe, um, we've covered lots of ground. Is, is there anything that you'd like to add that we haven't covered? Well, gosh, you know, I asked that question at the end of my podcast as well. <laughs> it, it's, um, it goes back to when I, when I did my life as um, in blue chip organizations, I started off in manufacturing and I ended up as an HR director. So I did loads of um, sort of management level, board level recruitment. And um, that was always my favorite last question in the interview. You know, is there anything that you haven't told me that I haven't given you a, a chance to ask? And um, you did used to get some really good answers actually. Um, no, I'm really happy. I'm really happy to come back as well because I think we could get into the, um, the dietary guidelines, dietary fat, more saturated fat, why is saturated fat, why it's absurd to think of saturated fat as harmful in any way, um, what's it in, um, nutrition generally, fibre, there's plenty of other places we can go, so we'll, we'll do another one. Fabulous, well if, if, you've, if you've got the time and inclination to make a, a, a term visit, we would be absolutely delighted to have you. On it, no And worries. in the meantime, listen, thank you so much. I hope you've enjoyed the conversation as much as I had. I have, and I'm sure our audience will, absolutely. So um, once again, Zoe, thank you so much, and we hope to see you again, well, face-to-face -face at a future conference. Oh, crikey, wouldn't that be lovely? Thanks so much. <laughs> I've really enjoyed it. Thank All right. You. Take care, Zoe. Thank you for listening. And if, before you leave, if you haven't already done so, please subscribe to our media channels. That way you won't miss future episodes with our other amazing guests.